people. Let's just, well, hopefully, man, when you look upon the face of God and, and his, in His Word and see what His Word has for you, maybe you'll leave the house today with joy. It's all about joy. I believe that joy in our hearts, we, sometimes we lose our joy. We lose our joy uh, throughout our week, maybe, maybe throughout your job. You just feel like you, you just drained and maybe through school something's got you, something took your joy. That's not God's intention. God's intention for you is to have joy unspeakable and what? Full of glory. What does that mean? That means that we come together as the people of God to celebrate His love and His love for other people. That's what He gives us. Joy is what today is all about. So many put so many people put so much focus on times like Easter and Christmas. But I believe that joy, God's joy lasts all year long. Amen? God's joy lasts all year long. And we, we should look for God's joy. We should look for His blessings. And we know that joy comes in the morning. Everyone needs that celebration. Everyone needs a spiritual awakening. Amen? We need a spiritual awakening in the house today. But that being said, I want to continue our series. If you've been here for the past three weeks, you've been really deep involved in a series called The History of Easter. The history of Easter. What is the history of Easter? It's the moments leading up until Jesus' death on the cross, His burial, and His resurrection that we celebrate today. We, we just read maybe the first of the service about how they came to the tomb early on Sunday morning. And they made a point to put that in there. They, they came to the tomb early on Sunday morning, and there they didn't find him at all. They found an angel there. That's not who they wanted to see. They, they found an angel. They said, he is risen. He is not here. And go look for him out there. Well, what do you mean? What happened to Jesus? Jesus arose from the dead. He was resurrected, just like we'll all be resurrected one day if we believe in Jesus Christ. The history of Easter, we've been looking at the who, what, when, where. Today is the why and the how. Amen. So if you're making notes today, I hope you are. Uh, just make sure, I just want to remind everyone too, but if you need uh, uh, something to make notes with, we have our bulletins there every Sunday morning, most, most of the time. Every Sunday morning out there in the foyer, on the back, there's places to make notes. If you have any, if you're looking for any announcements, that's where they're going to be today on the bulletin. Uh, so just want to remind you. So let's dive right into, if you're making notes, let's just, add, let's just write this three-letter word down. Why? Why? Everyone say why. Well, because I asked you to. That's why. But no, you may have asked yourself, why am I here? Not, not here. We know what you're doing here, but why am I here? It's a deeper question. What's my purpose? Why do I exist? What does God have for me? Why am I here? Some of us ask this question so many times and you're trying to find your purpose in life. Maybe you already know your purpose and you're down deep into it and you're neck deep into your purpose and all of a sudden you turn around and go, am I truly supposed to be here? Why am I here? Anybody ever asked that before? Anybody ever? These are the contemplating things that God probably puts in your heart. You may not think it's from God, but sometimes it's from God because God wants to self-evaluate you. Why are you here? Sometimes God asks you, what's your purpose? And we say, God, I, you know my purpose. You know why I'm here. But no, do you know why you're here? Why are we here? We're here because of one person, and that's Jesus Christ. I want to answer the question of why we're all here generally by one of the most famous scriptures in history, and that's John 3.16. But I'm going to read verse 17 as well. And I'm reading from the New King James Version, this, this particular scripture. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Well, you can't have John 3.16 without 17. <laughs> For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, 
but that the world through him may be saved. We have to understand that's why we're here. Our purpose is we're saved by grace. Our purpose is to worship God. Everyone here is created to worship. Everyone who is present in the house and who is in our communities that's not here today or that's in other churches all across this country, this county, whatever, we're all serve, we all serve one purpose and that purpose is to worship God. Why? Because He came to this world so that we may be saved. Saved from what? Saved from what? Saved, saved from that's all. That's all Christian needs to me, baby. Saved. That's what we talk about. Saved. Well, I'm saved. What are you saved from? Do we know? Have we, re have we repeated this language for so long that we have forgotten why He came and, and what He's done? Remember, the question today is why. If we're not asking these serious questions today, then I believe that we've lost something along the way in our Christianity if you're saved. And if you're not saved, this is a perfect time to evaluate your life. People know when they're saved and when they're not. How, how do you know? Well, I gave my life to Christ at, at, at four years old, and, and I'm good to go. Well, if you don't go back in your life and reevaluate where you've been, sometimes God will show you some things in your life that he, He'll hit you upside the head with and say, Okay, listen, have you trusted me always? Have you given your heart to me always? Why are you here some people have failed to listen to the voice of God that comes through the Word of God. That's why it's called the Word of God. This is His Word to us. This is His communication to us. Have you picked it up and dusted it off and found your purpose today? For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whosoever, whosoever, that's me and you. Who are the whosoever's? Can you say amen if you're a whosoever? Amen. I'm a whosoever. Believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The why we are here is to spread that news. It's to spread that gospel. It was a miracle. It, it, was, it was a miracle for us even to be here. Because like I've said for the last three weeks, we all have fallen short of God's glory. We are the ones who put Jesus up there on that cross. He went to Calvary for the sins of mankind, me and you, on His shoulders. We did that. I've never seen Jesus before. What are you talking about? i never nailed anybody to a cross before. No, but your sins put Him up there. Your sins have put Him there. So we're asking the question, why? Why did Jesus come? One reason is to say He came to save. We needed saving as human beings. We needed saving from Satan and His ways concerning us. If you believe in God, you best better believe in a devil too. If you believe in angels, that angels surround us, you best better believe in there's demons too. Because there's another realm around us. It's called the spiritual realm. And it's not like ghosts, they're not spooky, it's not scooby doo -ish, okay? It's, what it is, is reality. It's a more of a reality than this one. The spiritual realm is where battles are won and lost. Sometimes battles are won and lost in your own mind. Well, that's the spiritual realm going at it. It's ourselves. We have, we have to, what are we saved from? We're saved from Satan. We're saved from what he has for us. The wages of sin is death. And we're saved from that death through the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. We all know the Bible says in John 10.10 10, that the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. This means everything in your life. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy your good name. Amen. He wants to destroy your consciousness. Some people's got to think about this for a second. He wants to destroy everything about you. Your good name, your will, your everything. He wants to destroy everything about you. We have to understand that. So Jesus came to save us from this. It's true. Some of us contemplate this and ask, is it real? 
And, I, I, and I'm just being honest with you. And I can be honest with you, I hope. <laughs> We've all contemplated, is this real? Even me. We've all went back and forth into our mind and say, did he really say that? Did he really, was he really there? Or we're, we're relying all of our information on an ancient text. Is it true? And then God shows up and performs a miracle. And then God shows up and performs and gives you the money you needed just in time. And then God shows up and saves you from that accident that you, that you were supposed to run into. Everything, I'm telling you, He surrounds you and binds you. He keeps you safe and He does all these things. And He, listen, He speaks to your heart. Is He real? And we can say, Amen, He's real. <laughs> When they walked into the tomb, did they just make this up on their own? Well, there was Jesus laying. Well, let's make something up. Yeah, let's tell him he wasn't here. No, listen, we all contemplate those things. And you're a liar if you say you don't. Because the devil tempts you with, with lies. That's his job. He tempts you. He whispers in your ear. This isn't true. Don't believe it. Because he, wants you, he, don't, he doesn't want you to go to that next level with God. Because God says, come on up here with me. And the devil says, no, you need to stay down here with me. You're not being effective if you're with me. If you're down, if you're away from God. The Bible says if we draw closer to him, he what? He draws closer to us. That's exactly what happens. There's nothing that good comes from Satan. Amen? Amen? Nothing at all comes good from the devil. So we know that Jesus came to save us from the devil's grasp. But listen, you have to realize this, that he also came to save you from yourself. Amen. Jeremiah 17, verse 9 through 10. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due reward according to what their actions deserve. What does this mean for us? According to Scripture, that your heart, everybody say my heart, who you truly are. I'm not talking about the organ that beats. I'm talking about who you truly are in the core, on the inside. You may put a face on in front of church people and you say, hey, everything's okay with me. And then you get in your car and everything's just not okay with you. You may put a face on between people and people will never really truly know who you really are. But God says, I, the Lord, search all the hearts. And he says this, the human heart is the most deceitful things. Think about the most despicable thing that you've ever seen. I mean, the most disgusting thing. I mean, just vile, nasty, just whatever word you want to use there to explain something gross or whatever. And then God tells us that the human heart, the one that we carry around with us every single day, is the most deceitful thing that ever was in the earth. Desperately wicked. Why is that? Is because He created us in His image. And we've failed Him. And we've turned our backs on Him so many times it's not funny. Be honest with yourself. Nobody in this church is holier than thou. If you think you're better than anybody else, I want you to get up and leave right now. Nobody got up. I was, I was worried about that part. <laughs> Listen, we're, it's true. There's no, we're all sinners. We're all broken. We're all deceitful. But there's something that's paid our price, and that's the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus. He's paid everything. He's done everything. He's done all the hard work for you. You do not have to live a life of sin and darkness anymore. We know that Jesus came not to only to save us from the enemy's grasp, but to save us from ourselves. Because the human heart is deceitful. If we can bow before the Lord Jesus and say, God, my heart is deceitful. My heart is wicked. I think of bad thoughts. I, I do bad things. The actions that come out of my body aren't, aren't what you want me to do. Would you help me? And he, he comes in and he interjects. And he does something. And that's when we're truly saved. That's what it means to be saved. It's, it's, it's not over anymore. We're done. We're saved. Amen? It's, it's, it's done. It's, it, it's in the past. Now you may say to yourself, I'm not a bad person. I do good things. 
I'm here there for my family. I'm there for my friends. I'm, I'm not going to go out here and, and intentionally murder someone. That may be true by the world's standards. But see, God's standards and the world's standards are totally different. All you have to do is read a newspaper or watch. Does people read newspaper anymore? No. All right. Go on the computer and read the newspaper. Okay? That's what people do. Or watch TV or, or look on Facebook or do anything. Listen, all you have to do is look around you. The world's standards and God's standards are not nowhere near the same standards. We are all here and we're broken. But there is something that's sewn us up together. And that's the love of Christ. The love of God. I have a friend who pastors a church, and that church is named Favor of God. Man, I love that name of that church. The favor of God. And that's what He's given us each and every day. The Bible says that, that His mercies are new every morning. And that mercy, the sin that you committed yesterday, you admit that sin to God and you turn away from it. He cleansed you and, and that's it's over. It's done. Can we understand that today? And, and we come to church and we hear these things over and over again, right? I, I've preached this whole series, this three weeks about our sins and about the things that we've done. I've preached all this. And you're like, okay, listen, you need to hang it up on the sin thing. No, listen, we're still sinning. That's right. We're still out here doing the sin. And so it needs to be repeated. Amen? Amen. We're still out here rolling the streets like we used to. That's not what God wants us to do. Another reason why He came is to lead us. He came to lead and He came to teach. Jesus was the best leader and teacher that ever existed. Amen? Can you, can you be honest with me today and say He was the best leader and teacher that ever existed. We all need someone to follow. We've all followed someone, someone famous or maybe an influential person in your family or maybe it was a brother, maybe it was a sister or, or a mom and dad or, or an uncle or somebody. We all look up to someone in our life. We all have had that. Whether it was Superman, I don't care who it was, okay? Clark Kent was cool, all right? Let's just be honest. But he wasn't as cool as Superman, all right? So you follow Superman, not Clark Kent. That's how it works. But listen, we, we follow someone in our life. We, we bow down before God and we say, God, it's got to be you. It's got to be you in our life. If we see an influential person in our life, we are naturally going to copy the way that person is. In this life, there is more caught than taught. Think about that for a second. We catch the mannerisms of those who influence us. Jesus must have had the personality of a master influencer. How could anyone just go up to a man and say, hey, hey what's going on? Peter, I'm Jesus. Stop what you're doing. Leave your job and everything and come follow me. And Peter's like, all right. You know, let's do it. That's why we read it. But that's, he must have had a, a deep influence on people. Think about his influence. Think about how people followed him. He came to lead us. He came to save us from Satan. He came to save us from ourselves. And he came to lead us out of a lifestyle that we shouldn't be living in the first place. That we were never created to live. And that's what he did. There's more cult than taught. We need to pass along spiritual knowledge. Maybe you're an influencer. Maybe you're an influential person to someone. Maybe you think you're not old enough to do that. That's not true. There's people that follow people in school all the time. Maybe you think you're too old. That's not true, man. There is wisdom in age. No matter where you are in life, someone could be influenced by you. There's been times in my life that I have questioned my ability. There's been times in my life that I question what God's called me to do. There's been times in my life that, that every single time that I, I go up against a problem, the devil pushes back and says, you better quit. But Jesus says, listen, I didn't call you to wimp out. I called you to stand up and do. It's through the tough times. The tough times is what makes us. That's exactly what kind of leader that Jesus was. He faced nothing but hard times. 
he faced nothing but a hard time. Everyone, ever since he tried to preach the gospel, ever since he tried to preach the word of God, he was, people were after him. And they says in the word of God that they contemplated about how they could take him down. And they, and they worked on this and they were working on something. How do we take out Jesus? How do we take him out? How? And so they spent their life figuring out how to take down this person who claims to be a prophet. You can't hold back Jesus. I don't care if it's physical or spiritual. You can't hold him back. Somebody ought to catch that later on this evening. Amen. Another, why, another reason why Jesus came is to give us life and a life that matters. I hear all the time from people and it really, it turns my heart that their life isn't what they want it to be. Very rarely is your life what you think it was. When you're 18 years old, very rarely is it what you, what you thought it would be. Amen? Very, very rarely. And so we, we get on this mindset of this is not who I'm supposed to be. This is not who I am. But God says, listen, I came. And John 10.10 10 says that the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus says, I came to give you life and life more abundantly. He came to give us life. And not a life that's, that's just somber or, or just going through the motions of each and every day. He tells us He came to give us life. That's where that joy comes in. That we're, we're looking for things everywhere to fill in the gaps that God is supposed to be in. And we're looking for all these things to, to put inside of ourselves. And God just says, look, just put me in there and everything's going to be okay. I came to give you life, an exciting life, a life full of joy, unspeakable and full of glory. I try, I try to give give you all these things, but don't push me away. Don't fill in the holes with other things. I came to give you life. We ask ourselves why, and the, and the answer is simple. Why? Because we couldn't. We couldn't. We couldn't what? We couldn't save. We couldn't save us from the devil. We couldn't save our own selves. We couldn't save our family. We can't lead. We can't do anything. So Jesus came to do all that stuff for us. No matter how hard you try, there are certain things in your life that you cannot achieve on your own. Happiness and joy is one of those things I feel. You can't achieve happiness and joy on your own. You're going to fail. You're flawed. You're a person. You're a human. Anybody ever heard that expression? I'm just, I'm just a man. I'm just human. I'm only human. Yeah, that's true. You're only human. But if you ask Jesus Christ into your heart, you become a supernatural human. And everything is washed away. Everything is better. Everything is right. You say, you don't know how I, I grew up. I grew up in a bad home, so I'm just, no, listen. You are the only one that can tr control your destiny. You're the one. I don't care if you grew up in a bad home or not. A lot of people grow up in a bad home. But guess what? They make something of their own selves by calling the name of Jesus Christ. And He comes in and He rearranges the furniture, baby. And He paints the walls and He makes all things what? New. You're looking for something new today. Look no further than Jesus Christ. John 14, 6. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, everyone say no one. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, then you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And we're going to tell you, he was talking to his disciples about Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no person, not me or you, can come to God or is worthy, everyone say worthy, worthy, worthy enough to come to God but through Jesus Christ. Moving on to our last question of this whole series. Last question. It's not a W question. It's a H. It's how. How? We've covered the who, the what, the when, the where, the why, but what about the how? There's many questions in this question. Like, how did he live? How did, how did Jesus live? Have you ever wondered to yourself and just imagined, man, I would love to be in those days. I just want to watch. I, I know the outcome. I know what's going to happen. There's nothing you can do to change it, praise God, because it saves me and you. 
But wouldn't you just like to be a fly on the wall and just listen to the way he talked? What was his tone? How did he live? How did he conduct business? You know, before he was preaching, he was a carpenter. He, he, he was a, a, many translations go for a stonemason, he, but he was a builder. How did he conduct his own business? He worked with his hands. How did he talk to people? When you got done finished business with Jesus, would you walk away going, man, I got it. that's a great deal. You know, well, well, how would that be? How would he do? He was a business owner. That's how it was. And, and when he preached, how did he preach? You know, you just feel like, man, I just want to listen to a Jesus message. Do they have it on DVD? You know, when, when you go to heaven and, and you're like, man, can I just watch the, the Sermon on the Mount? You got that DVD? <laughs> can I just throw that in? Maybe it's a VCR in heaven. I don't know. Maybe one works where you don't have to rewind it. I don't know. Old school 90s. Oh, man. I think Jesus lived life to the fullest. Read about how he spoke to people. Read on how he communicated with people. He lived life to the fullest. And he called out stuff that was wrong. And he wasn't afraid to stand up and say, that's not right. He wasn't afraid to do the right thing. He lived life to the fullest. Many of us have a perception on how he lived. And we see these, these paintings of how, what that artist's perception of how he lived. Sometimes it's children around him, or sometimes it's him on the cross. But how did he really live? You see, Jesus sometimes is not a painting or another person's perception. It's how he lives inside you. It's how He changes you. You can tell how Jesus lived when you give your heart to Him and watch your own life change. That's how He lived. He changed people's lives. And He lived sacrificially. What does that mean? Everything He did from start to finish was for someone else. Never for Himself. If it was for Himself, He would have never came. He wouldn't have to. He didn't have to come here. He didn't have to save your life. He didn't have to teach us how to live or how to lead or how to love. He didn't have to do anything, but He did it because He loves us. We see Easter as a celebration because He rose from the dead, but we also see Easter as a celebration because of the life that He lived and continues to live in us. Another question is, that, that's how he lived. But how did he die? We, are, we already know these, these things. Most of us know the answer to how he died. He died on a cross at Calvary. But it's so important to see in the spirit, the, the spirit of believers that's reminded of this tragedy. Let's look at Luke chapter 23, verse 39. Listen, this is how he died. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it. By saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, Don't you fear God? Even when you have been sentenced to die, we deserve to die for our crimes. But this man, this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I sure I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. Amen. So he hung on the cross and his own body was bleeding out and his own body was broken and he was concerned about the man next to him. You see in the man's heart next to him, that's who we see. That is the picture. Why did, why did two criminals die on, the, on each side of Jesus? Because it gives us a picture of humanity. On one side you have people who refuse to believe and mock and scoff and do, oh, well, I'm not religious by no means. They have all these people over here. I'm not telling you to be religious. Don't get me wrong. I got a whole sermon about that, baby. Don't worry about that. But you have one person that refuses to believe and the other person that says, Jesus, I believe you. This man did not have time to live a Christ-centered life. He didn't have time to evangelize. He didn't have time to do anything but simply believe. You can't tell me that there's not people dying every day that all of a sudden wake up to a light that never lived a life of Christ ever. 
and then all of a sudden someone comes to their bedside and says, you need to believe in Jesus. Well, that, that you just scared them into, and no, listen, that's what happens. Jesus. That's what happened to this man. So you're telling me this man's faith isn't good? I'm not going to listen to that. You believe Jesus one little minuscule in your whole entire life, and he'll give you eternal life. That's what this man did. And what did he do? He did two things. He, he has confessed his sin. I deserve to be here. I deserve to hang on this cross. But this man didn't do anything wrong. Jesus, remember me. He didn't say, come into my heart. He didn't pray a sinner's prayer. He didn't say, he said, Jesus, remember me. That's right. And sometimes we're at the break of, of, of everything in our life to shatter and, and fall into pieces. And all we can say to Jesus is, God, remember me. Everything's falling apart around me. Do you remember me, God? I, I, I miss my loved ones who's gone. I, I can't get my life straightened out. There's not enough money. There's not enough food. There's not enough anything in my life. My family's broken. God, remember me. And he does each and every time. We don't have to die. We do not have to die if you believe in Christ. We get to live because of his death. It brings us to another question. How does he still live? It's hard to us to understand the things of God at times. When we read the Bible, we start to formulate questions. We start to ask, how is this possible? And we read how the tomb was open and Jesus' body wasn't there. Only angels saying, he isn't here. And this isn't normal. We no longer read that we die. We read that we live. That's how he still lives. Our last question of how. How will he come back? We've heard this maybe all your life. And this is the first time you're hearing this. I want to let you know that he will come back the same way he left. The Bible says that he was risen and he, was, he, he floated up to heaven and he'll come back the same way. How will he come back? I want to refer to scripture. I will call the band back up too. And he says this, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet Him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage others with these words. That's how it happens. That's the last how. How it happens is this. The dead in Christ will rise first. And then when you see those empty graves, you better get ready. Because it's your time then. And we'll live forever with God. That's the promise that He gives us. I'm looking forward to being surrounded by my family who's gone on before us. And standing shoulder to shoulder with that person and those people and those friends. I'm looking forward to that. And we have something to look forward to today.